Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Well, I wanted to take a moment to thank everybody for coming here today. My name is Jacob Archuleta, and I am uh, president of the Abaya Fellowship. So this event is sponsored by the Abaya Fellowship, and uh, we wanted to thank everybody, including the volunteers who have helped, and of course, all the speakers who are coming today. So a big round of applause for everybody. Please, thank you. <laughs> so um, just wanted to say a word about the Abaya Fellowship. We are a, a Buddhist nonprofit organization that is founded by Chakung Jigme Wangdrak Rinpoche. And um, our goal is to uh, facilitate the study and practice of uh, Buddhism in the West, particularly uh, within the Nyingma tradition of Tibetan Buddhism and uh, within the Dujum Tersar lineage, uh, which Chakun Jime Wangdrak Rinpoche is a lineage holder and also a family lineage holder. So there's a family lineage within the Dujum Tersar tradition. And we are located in El Cerrito. Um, so, without further ado, uh, I'd encourage everybody to um, put their cell phones off or any other devices you might have. And um, I would also like to uh, introduce Wes Nisker. Wes Nisker has kindly agreed to be the moderator for today. And. Um, just a word about Wesk, he is a Buddhist meditation teacher, author, and performer. And for nearly 40 years, Mr. Nisker has worked in radio, first as a news anchor, and most recently as a commentator. During his career, winning the Billboard Magazine Columbia School of Journalism and San Francisco Media Alliance Awards for Excellence in Radio Programming. He was recently inducted into the Bay Area Radio Hall of Fame. That's it, I guess, huh? <laughs> I was invited to say a few words myself about who I am, so <clears throat> I'll continue with that where he left off and say that uh, basically now I am a uh, Berkeley Buddhist, and I, I meet together with my Buddhist friends quite often, uh, several hundred of them. We usually meet in a church, and so this is very appropriate to be here. Um, who am I, really? Uh, Mid-sized mammal, I know that, a part of me anyway. Uh, I'm a human being. I'm, uh, I'm an earthling. Yes, I'm an earthling. I'm a Milky Wayan. <laughs> it's time that we got I, galaxy identified, you know. And I assume that I'm one with everything. Maybe I'll find out tonight. I don't know. Uh, as, someone, as someone once said, those who have achieved oneness can move on to two-ness. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's an honor to have been invited to come here and moderate this uh, evening's event. I, I'm not sure what's required of me or what it will uh, include, but I think at the end of the evening I will get a chance to 
proclaim the winter, the winner. <laughs> so, um, could the panelists come on? <laughs> the speakers, uh, this is your cue. This is, this is, this is the bell that uh, tells them if they're going over their time. A wealth of wisdom on this stage. So I'm going to uh, read some short bios of the people up here. Kempo Tsultrum Lodro, a contemporary Nyingma teacher of Tibetan Buddhism. He serves as head of the largest monastic community in the world, with roughly 30 to 40,000 monks and nuns. It has produced hundreds of Kempos and Kenmos, male and female professors of Buddhist philosophy. Kempo is an influential public intellectual and a strong advocate of Tibetan culture. For more than a decade, the core of Kenshin's efforts has been concentrated in Tibetan areas, promoting environmental awareness, education, public health, vegetarianism, and the importance of protecting living beings and abstaining from taking life. He is very venerated in Tibet, in his home country. Anam Tupton grew up in Tibet. There you are and at an early age began to practice in the Nyingma t tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. He's founder and spiritual advisor of Dharmata Foundation, teaching widely in the U.S. and abroad. The author of various articles and books in both Tibetan and English. His books in English include The Magic of Awareness and No Self, No Problem. Sharon Salzberg, a central figure in the field of meditation, a world-renowned teacher and New York Times best-selling author. She's played a crucial role in bringing meditation and mindfulness practices to the West and into mainstream culture since 1974. She's the co-founder of the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts, and the author of 10 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Real Happiness, and her seminal work, Loving Kindness, and her forthcoming release, Real Love. I've, we figured, how many years have we known each other? Since December 1970. December 1970, as we both were in India to take our first meditation retreat. Uh, Norman Fisher, Zoketsu. Norman Fisher, a poet, Zen Buddhist priest, for many years he taught at the San Francisco Zen Center, uh, co-abbot there from 1995 to 2000. He's presently a senior Dharma teacher there as well and the founder and spiritual director of the Everyday Zen Foundation, an organization dedicated to adapting Zen Buddhist teachings to Westerners. Jack Cornfield, trained as a Buddhist monk in the monasteries of Thailand, India, and Burma. He's taught meditation internationally since 1974 and is one of the key teachers to introduce Buddhist mindfulness practice to the West. He met and studied as a monk under the Buddhist master Venerable Ajahn Chah, as well as the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw of Burma. Jack co-founded the Insight Meditation Society with fellow, fellow meditation teachers Sharon Salzberg and Joseph Goldstein, and also co-founder of the Spirit Rock Center. Next, I want to introduce Jennifer Berezin, uh, loved uh, and re highly regarded musician, 
blend of singer, songwriter, producer, activist. Over the course of 10 albums, she has developed and explored recurring themes with a rare wisdom. Her lifelong involvement in environmental, women's, and other justice movements, as well as an interest in Buddhism and earth-based spirituality, are at the heart of her writing. So, I think we are blessed to have a song. There she is. This is Evely Posh. We're going to start with a piece to send out good um, intentions for the world. So we hope you'll join us when that comes around in the, in the piece. I cannot turn my eyes I cannot count the cost Of all that has been broken All that has been lost I cannot understand The suffering that life brings War and hate and hunger And a million other things When I've done all that I can And I try to do my part Let sorrow be the doorway Into an open heart And the light on the hills Is full of mercy The wind in the trees, it comes to save me. This silence, it will never desert me. I long to hold the whole. Yeah. 
with another song at the end of the, e end of the evening. The song brings us together. And here we are, all of us together. And each of the speakers tonight will get a, a, an amount of time, five to 10 minutes, to make a statement about the theme. Uh, and I, if, if they start to run over, I will ring this little bell. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and we, uh, Kempo, you will start, please. Yeah. Right now? Yes. 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 Good evening to everyone. And thank you all for coming along evening to this dialogue of ours. Uh, uh, from a Buddhist perspective, there are many causes and conditions for everyone coming together in this earth, in this place together. And in coming together in one place in this lifetime, in the next life, everyone will go off in all kinds of other directions. <laughs> It's just like the different airports around the world. In the course of one day, many different aeroplanes arrive at, in, in these various airports. And and after landing for half an hour or one hour, they take off again and head off to other destinations around the world. It's just like this. However, after parting from one another, we will come back together again at some point. So for the period of time that we are here on this earth, it's very important that everyone uh, lives in a way that is happy. And it's also very important that the lifestyles we lead on this earth are ones that don't cause damage to the natural environment. 
And the reason for this is that after we depart, many people are coming after us. And we ourselves have to return many times too. And so it's uh, for this reason very important that our lifestyles don't cause harm to the environment or destruction to the environment. And in addition to the, the natural environment, it's very important that the lifestyles we lead are ones that don't cause harm to other humans and uh, to other creatures, animals too. And uh, besides not uh, besides not doing harm to the environment, we should also endeavor to live in a way that benefits it. Benefits it, benefit, uh, benefits animals, benefits others. And in order to do this, our minds are very important. So when we uh, speak of the mind in Buddhism, we're not speaking about the brain. And we're not speaking about the uh, heart either, the organ of the heart. Uh, what we are talking about is the mind or consciousness. So when we cause harm to the external environment, this um, harm actually originates in our minds to begin with. When we humans harm other humans and when we harm animals, all of these harms originate to begin with in our own minds. And the same with our own states of mind, our happiness or our unhappiness, all of these states of mind originate in our own minds too. So up until the present point in time, uh, humanity has uh, invested so much in terms of the external environment, in terms of its efforts, its research energies, etc. And uh, relatively, the energy that has been expended on changing the mind and uh, pro developing the mind, progressing the mind has been uh, less. So, uh, today in coming together, if we are able to change our own minds, then it's possible for us to change the world. That's what we're saying today. So many people say that with the arrival of new forms of high technology, such as mobile phones and computers, our world is really changing. And it's true that they are changing the lives of people in the world. However, the real changer of things in the world is our own mind. 
Then the ending also seemed the Yabuz Yona, then also Mutsi the Jabuz Yonga dogs. And if we are able to uh, make our minds good, then the world can be made good too. Then you also seem the Yabu Mayona, and also so Ranki Po Mayon be Matsat, then you must Yamba Mambo and Makipa in the zone dogs. And when our minds are not well, then we are not happy. And in addition to that, we also uh, make others unhappy. So one uh, Buddhist viewpoint is that uh, if we are able to change our own minds, then the external world uh, changes accordingly. So in this way, uh, we, our topic for this evening is changing one's own mind in order to change the world. In order to change the world by changing our minds, um, there are two steps or levels to this process. And the, the lower level or the first step is the level of our everyday lives. And then beyond that, the second level is a higher one that uh, uh, is somewhat beyond this level of our everyday lives. So many people think that our minds rely on our brains. However, uh, the Buddhist perspective holds that our um, world is created by our mind. So how are we to understand this? If we were to, say, wake up in the morning really early in a good state of mind and head out the door to work, then everyone you encounter uh, seems to be favorably disposed to you. They seem to be smiling at you and um, uh, uh, favorably inclined. And the external environment appears beautiful and lovely and uh, very much in uh, harmony with one's own mind. If, on the other hand, when we wake up in the morning, our mind is full of grumpiness, grudges, and anger, then when we head out the door, then we uh, perceive everyone as looking at us in an angry way or as if they don't like us. This is how we perceive others. And no matter where we go, uh, the environment appears to us as unpleasant and uh, um, does not create within us a uh, favorable or pleasant feeling. But in actual fact, it is not the case that uh, people don't like us. And 
And it's not the case that the environment is unpleasant. In actual fact, there's been no change in the environment whatsoever. However, for the reason that we are unhappy in our own minds, this is how the environment appears to us. So for this reason, we can see that um, taking care of our minds and changing our minds, uh, working on our minds, is a, is a very important thing. If our minds are happy, then it's possible when we go into an elevator that we'll smile at people and be able to make pleasant conversation. And when we go in and out of doors, when we cross the road and go about our business, we will find ourselves sincerely uh, from our hearts inter interacting with others in a, um, a friendly way. And uh, when we, from the depth of our heart and with sincerity, smile at others and speak kind words to them, greet them nicely, this makes others happy. If a person who starts off with an unhappy state of mind uh, goes uh, out and uh, encounters uh, a few people who treat them in a, fr in a friendly uh, way, then their minds automatically will become happy too. So being able to change one's mind has a lot of benefit. And then beyond this level, the higher level, if we're able to make changes to our mind, then it's uh, really the case that the world starts to change. So the main uh, point or, of uh, uh, our conversation is tonight to emphasize the importance of uh, taking care of one's mind and changing one's mind in order to lead a happy life. And uh, all of the uh, teachers here tonight will be talking about this, changing one's mind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kempo. Could we, would you please introduce your translator who's doing such a wonderful job? Oh. Um. <laughs> uh. Uh, my name is uh, Catherine Hardy, and I come from Australia, and I am Kempo's translator. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so next, we're going to hear from Norman Fisher. Okay, is this on? Can you hear? Oh, good. Hi, everybody. Uh, I would like to uh, suggest three practices for changing your mind. Uh, the first one. I'm just thinking about right now because I'm so happy to be sitting up here with good friends. Uh, everybody here is a good friend of mine that I knew, I've known a long time. And Kempo, I'm just meeting tonight, 
but he's already a good friend I've known for a long time. <laughs> I think if you uh, spend any time with him, you'll feel the same way. So that's the first practice. If you are as lucky as I am, and you have also some good friends who are in your life uh, promoting kindness, and peacefulness, who really love you, this is precious. Uh, don't take this for granted. Uh, practice being with those friends and telling them how important they are to you. That will change your mind and change your world if you practice like that. The second practice is uh, dedication of merit. They say that uh, when people come together with good intentions, caring about one another, caring about the world, it actually makes a difference. They generate strength and energy collectively. I think we're actually doing that at this very moment. We're all sitting here together, having just heard that great teaching. I don't know about you, but it made me feel very peaceful, very happy to hear that teaching. I think we've generated a lot of strength together and good intentions by being here, first of all, and by hearing these teachings. So on behalf of everybody sitting up here and, and all of you, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to give away all of this good spiritual energy. I'm going to give it away on behalf of all of us uh, to the happiness and well-being of all creatures on this planet, most especially children and their mothers who take care of them, that every one of those children and their mothers would have everything they need to have healthy lives and be well taken care of, and that all the creatures on the planet are treated with respect and kindness. Let's dedicate the energy that we're creating right now toward that. And that's a practice that we can do right now, but you can also do it every single day. Why don't you, before you go to bed tonight, and every night from now on, before you get in bed, think for a minute about the great things that you did today to be kind and have good thoughts and be of benefit to other people and dedicate the energy and the merit of what you generated today toward the well-being of everyone. And I think if you practice that every day, I pretty much guarantee it will change your mind and change the world. And the last practice I want to offer to you is the practice of forgiveness. I think that this world is in sore need of forgiveness. We have to forgive each other. We have a lot to forgive each other for. Ladies and gentlemen, what a mess <laughs> we have made. It's a shame. We all did it together. We did it together. So we have to forgive ourselves. We have to forgive human beings for being human beings. We have to forgive the world for being the world. And you're in luck. I happen to be an official <laughs> forgiver. <laughs> in fact, I have here in my little satchel my forgiver's license. <laughs> Not only that, I have a stack of forgiver's licenses, and I'm going to pass them out starting with my colleagues. 
so that everybody here can also be an official forgiver. <laughs> because we need to forgive and we need to have people who can facilitate forgiveness. Now, it'll take a little bit of work. Uh, the, the license alone won't do it. <laughs> but the license will help. And if, every, if anybody now has a telephone, do you have a smartphone? You should take it out now. I'm serious. Now, take out your smartphone now. Go to Google and type in, hey, how are you, Charlie? Type in uh, the center, C-E-N-T-E-R, the center for supportive, S-U-P-P-O-R-T-I-V-E, center for supportive bureaucracy. <laughs> the center for supportive bureaucracy is just what it sounds like. It's, it's, we have a lot of bureaucracy, and we need to make bureaucracy work for us. So the Center for Supportive Bureaucracy will issue compassion licenses, <laughs> forgiveness licenses. This is a brilliant project of my dear friend from Brooklyn, Ori Allon. And uh, go to that website, the Center for Supportive Bureaucracy, and you too can become a member of the Empowering Clerks Network and you can issue forgiveness licenses and other licenses. This is really, really important for our world. So those are the three practices I wanted to give you, and good luck. Thank you. Oh, and, and I, do have, I do have more forgiveness licenses up here. If anybody wants to take on the job of being a forgiver, after we're all done, I'll hang around for a minute, and I'm going to give out licenses to the first ones who ask for them. So thanks, everybody. What a beautiful thing that we're together. Huh? Jack Cornfield. Thank you. I'm also really pleased to be here with such beloved and good friends and to have met you, Kempo Rinpoche, um, and to see you all this evening. And at least I'm told that there are a zillion people who are going to watch this, or at least a hundred thousand or something like that. So, you know, smile, you're on camera. Anyway, um, and I want to ask you a question as I begin, and that is how many of you in this room have a regular or a dedicated Dharma and meditation practice. Almost all the hands went up for if the cameras have not captured this. Um, so this is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people um, in the USA. Um, and you represent the tip of an iceberg of hundreds of thousands and actually a number of millions of people. Um, so this should give encouragement to whoever is watching that that sense of community that Norman spoke about, the very first thing he said, that we really are in a, in a, in a community together. And as you know, um, the teachings of Buddha Dharma, particularly in the practices such as mindfulness and loving kindness and compassion, have begun to spread really widely in the culture in medicine, and in uh, education, and in, uh, I did a lecture at Berkeley Law School, in the arts, in so many different dimensions. Um, and they're spreading, I think, most importantly, because at this time the world needs them so much, and the modern world needs them. Um, when I first became a monk in the monasteries of Thailand with my teacher Ajahn Chah, and I heard the Dharma, first of all, he said, the Dharma is, I asked, what is the Dharma? And he said, the Dharma is the heart. Not the physical heart, as Rinpoche said, but when he meant the heart, he meant the nature of our mind itself. Um, and he said, there are ways for us as human beings to be happy, and these are the teachings of happiness of the Buddha, of generosity, of integrity and virtue, of learning to calm and direct our attention, of care for one another, of forgiveness, as Norman said. 
And I read the text from the Buddha that said, live in joy even among the difficulties of the world. Live in joy and well-being even among those who are sick. Live in joy and love even when there is conflict. And I thought, this is a remarkable thing. Um, but it turns out that it's possible. And not only is it possible, but I believe all these hands went up because there's something in us that was um, that longs for this and that was born in you and born in me and born in all of us, whether we call it Buddha nature or true nature, that there's something that knows when we look at the world that's um, outwardly creating so much suffering out of greed and hatred and fear and delusion, that something in us knows that this isn't the way. And so we come together to practice, we come together to listen to teachers like Kenpo. And we know that all the modern technology in the world, as he says, is not going to stop warfare and racism and climate disruption, that those come out of the human heart and that we have to change our minds as the theme of this evening. I was at the White House a year and a half ago for the first White House Buddhist leadership gathering. Um, I don't think it's going to happen again very soon. <laughs> But at the, end of this, at the end of this gathering, I kind of gave the summary address um, and I said that the Buddha also had met with ministers and princes and kings and, you know, various leaders in his time and that he gave direct instructions for a wise society in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta where he says, if a society treats its members with respect, when they gather, when they listen to one another, when they depart. If a society cares for the vulnerable among them, the women, the children, the, um, the elders of the society, they will prosper and not decline. If a society cares for the natural environment, that society will prosper and not decline. And these are understandings that are universal around the world. But here is the most important part. Because, okay, everyone would nod and say, this is a great idea. The thing that's offered in the teachings in Buddha Dharma is that there are ways to do it. It's not just that, okay, you should forgive and you should be compassionate and you should let go and not be so attached or, you know, frightened. But here are the trainings that allow us to cultivate compassion, to cultivate forgiveness, to practice mindfulness and loving-kindness in ways that when we repeat them in this systematic way, when we devote ourselves to them, if you make them something that matters, that, that are close to your heart, they change your life and they change everyone around you. And I think of this doctor who went to an eight-week mindfulness, compassion training. He was burnt out and the medical system is so difficult and he wanted to quit medicine and it was all too much. And he learned how to quiet his mind with mindfulness and tend his heart with loving kindness and compassion. And after about eight weeks, he was at work again and an old woman who had been a patient of his for years came in and looked at him and said, Doctor, I've been a patient of yours for a long time. Something's happened to you. You've changed. You're so present now. Are you in love or something? <laughs> and he was in love. He was in love with the world because he'd taken time to quiet his mind and tend his heart. And this is possible for all of us. Now, the spread of all these Dharma teachings is in part in concert with all the new modern neuroscience that says, yes, you can change your brain in neuroplasticity and you have greater um, in, uh, emotional resilience and you can focus better and all those kind of things and there's quicker physical healing. But the really deep piece is that we think, as Rinpoche says, we think of ourselves somehow at the effect of the world and with a deep attention, we begin to realize that it's consciousness itself, the heart and mind, that is the forerunner of all things, and that when our own heart and mind become quiet, when we tend them, um, we see the eyes of the people that we live with in a different way and love them. We, 
we see the environment, we care for things. Now one of the important things to remember is that in the Buddha's instructions for mindfulness, which go through every tradition, Theravada and Mahayana and Vajrayana at the core, like the Four Noble Truths as well, he says one will be mindful and kind, loving kindness as well, both inwardly and outwardly. And Buddhist practice in many, over many centuries and for many people has focused a lot on the inner transformation and neglected that part of the phrase of mindfulness inner and outer. In Zen, forgive me, Zen master, they say there are only two things, but you're a master of forgiveness, so I know you will. Thank you. I feel forgiven. <laughs> they say there are only two things. You sit and you sweep the garden, and it doesn't matter how big the garden is. So you quiet the mind and take your time every day in some way to tend your heart and ask what really matters, who am I, what matters in this life. And as you learn to do that, then you get up and you sweep the garden of the world. And you don't do it because you have to or you're supposed to serve it, but because it's you, it's your life, it's your family, it's your world, and so of course you love it. Now, you'll forget, as Albert Einstein said, according to Scientific American, if you can drive safely while kissing a girl, you're simply not giving the kiss the attention it deserves, right? <laughs> and the modern world doesn't want you to wake up very much. It's a consumer world that says buy more and get more. It's a world politically, and it has been for ages, that wants to frighten you. We all know this, and yet some part of us knows that there is another way. You do know this in your heart already. And so when you quiet yourself and tend your heart and look around to, to what's true in yourself, you realize that the outer fear and the outer consumerism and all those kind of false levels of happiness are like fake news, to use a term that we know and that there is a different kind of news. And that what we're asked to do is both to listen to that, the Dharma is the heart, to listen in that way, to change ourselves um, through attention, through compassion, through care. Um, and then take that loving awareness, which is a beautiful translation for mindfulness, to take that loving awareness, which is what you really are, um, and let it spread from you to all you touch. I saw a cartoon in the San Francisco Chronicle, and it showed uh, three camels crossing the Sahara Desert. The first camel had a father with bags and carpets, and the second was a mother on a smaller camel. And then behind, actually, there were a couple more small camels with the children on it. And the little girl was talking to her father, and she said, um, when are we going to get there, you know, <laughs> like children do in our culture? How soon are we going to get there, Daddy? And he stopped asking, and he turned back, and he said, stop asking how soon we're going to get there. We're nomads, for crying out loud, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is our life. Everything is changing. And the beautiful thing about the fact that everything is changing, even if it feels like it's painful and difficult, which is part of human incarnation, praise and blame and pleasure and pain and gain and loss, who doesn't have that? Is that because it's changing, when you change your heart, you can then go and plant seeds in the world that will change what you touch. And it's not yours to change the whole world, but it's yours to stretch out your hand and mend and touch that place that you can with your gifts. Um, and the Dharma inwardly uh, uh, gives you the power and the energy to know that you can do this. It gives you the capacity. Um, and then you can bring your blessings to what you touch. So, thank you. Sharon. Hey. Okay, how's that?
on, on, coming on. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Rinpoche, for the beautiful teaching and my friends, my colleagues. Um, well, listening to this, actually what came up in my mind was an early book of mine that I wrote called The Heart as Wide as the World. And originally that wasn't the title and quite a ways into the process that wasn't the title. I was sitting and listening to a colleague give a talk one day and she used that phrase, a heart as wide as the world. And I thought, that's it. So I called my long-suffering publisher and I said, I want to change the title. I can't even remember what the other title was. And they had already designed a cover and they'd gone you know, quite a ways into the process, so this was not easy. But finally they agreed, they said, okay, we'll call it a heart as wide as the world. And this was a long time ago, like, you know, 96, I think. And so they started sending me new possible cover art in the mail. And uh, of course the term a heart as wide as the world implies spaciousness and openness and expansiveness. And um, so I kept getting these sort of spacious open expansive prints, and one of them was really memorable. It was uh, some copy of a, a painting by Van Gogh. I don't remember the, the name of the painting. And it was like a big yellow sky. And just in the bottom corner, there were a few like crumbled huts. And it looked like a scene of terrible devastation. <laughs> and I looked at it and I thought, that looks awful. Like, you couldn't help but worry, what happened to the people in the huts, you know, and like, <laughs> awful. And I showed it to a, a friend of mine and she said, this looks like a world that could use some love. And of course it did not become the cover, but that phrase has stayed with me for decades now. This looks like a world that could use some love, which I would certainly assert is the truth of our time. This is a world that can use some love. And one of the things that I also find interesting in our time is that certain terms, and therefore the concepts behind them, have gotten, in my mind, sort of degraded and therefore lost to us. The word love so often seems to mean not being very smart and not having great wisdom and having no power and being kind of meek and um, giving in, sort of saccharine. You know, my, I have a, my first book actually was called Loving Kindness. And I have a friend who told me he was reading it on the New York City subway system. And he'd be so embarrassed to be seen reading a book called Loving Kindness <laughs> that he used to cover the cover. <laughs> and first I thought he meant he covered it with his fingers. But then I looked again at the cover and it's like really big letters. And I realized, no, he covered the cover, you know, like, wow. So what happens when the idea of love has kind of gotten degraded for us and feels more like a weakness than a strength and a force? It feels something more artificial or even hypocritical than something natural and, and obvious in a way. And the word compassion is the same. I'm, I'm told that if you, you know, if you do a Google search on a certain term, likely associations will come up like, oh, many people search for this, so maybe you are too. So if you type in Google, what will, well, if you type in compassion on Google, what will come up is compassion fatigue. That's the big association, exhaustion, depletion, it's too much, I can't handle it, I'm fatigued. I think I'll go to bed again, something, right? In contrast to seeing compassion as, first of all, that which unites us, that which lifts us out of kind of the pit of uh, tremendous self preoccupation and fear and loneliness and um, disconnection. So wouldn't it be incredible to really look at these words, these concepts, and these realities, 
and see what they mean for us and the possibilities that exist for, for transforming them. And it's just, just as Jack said, that transformation is real. It's, it's based on training. It's not just an idealistic fervor. You know, wouldn't it be great to forgive everybody? Yeah, right. You know, I mean, it is a process of, of looking and understanding and letting go and uh, venturing forth, being a little bit courageous too and stepping outside of our comfort zone. And that was one of the most fascinating things for me in my encounter with Buddha's teaching in that um, so many things I felt like I had the impression were kind of gifts in life and you either had them or you didn't like love or compassion. If you didn't, you were out of luck. We're seen as trainable. And the word trainable is a little cold maybe for us. But what a thing, you know, that we are, it's like a breathtaking view of human possibility, that we have a capacity, whoever we are, whatever we may have gone through in our personal lives, we all have a capacity to deepen love, to deepen compassion, to reconnect with ourselves and with one another. And meditation practice is one, of course, very potent way to do that training because it is believed also that qualities like love and compassion are emergent properties of how we pay attention. Do we look at one another or do we look through one another? Like who counts, who matters? Who doesn't count? Do we look at ourselves as full of potential and incorporating like the good within us and the good that we are capable of? Or do we just go down that list of our faults again and again and again? Are we paying attention at all? How many times have any of us recently been in conversation with somebody and not really listened because we're thinking about the 50 emails we need to attend to or the fact that I just got an email that my flight might be delayed tomorrow. That's terrible. What am I going to do? You know, right? So what if we actually noticed that kind of distractedness and gathered our attention and really arrived and discovered ourselves and discovered one another. So the training and attention that we do in mindfulness practice is really the same process writ large. We bring it out into the world. We learn to be present more. We learn to be interested more. We learn to see the uh, kinds of assumptions we make about one another and ourselves and realize that we don't have to hold tight to them, that we can see these and let them go and then really look again. So it's this tremendous, exciting process of, of seeing our entire lives as a kind of creative medium. Um, you know, this is the landscape that we are working on. And what we do within is exactly what is manifest without and will bring more love and compassion to this world and we, what we do outside in terms of caring for one another will reinforce that, that capacity and strengthen that capacity inside, so. It's working? Yes. yes yeah. uh, feels that uh, it's good to observe the silence right now, uh, but maybe I'm supposed to say a few words. Uh, there's a story of miracle took place in the city of Auckland uh, three years ago. A neighborhood uh, built an uh, uh, altar, outdoor altar, and shining image of a Buddha and other Buddhist uh, sacred uh, images. 
And then after a while, the neighbor who had uh, complained about uh, that uh, they are displaying the religious image in the public area, but the, the council of that neighborhood come together and they had discussion whether they should uh, dismantle that uh, religious uh, altar or not. But they learned that since the arrival of the, the sacred images, the rate of violence, uh, domestic violence, crime went down, so they decided to keep the altar outside. So this story is not coming from anywhere else, from actually here. So we do have a little bit of a story of miracles. And uh, I also believe that, uh, for example, when you look at the image of Buddhas or Bodhisattvas or deities, you will see that there is a sacred artistic ability. And those sacred images are created with uh, extraordinary artist, uh, meditative, enlightened artist uh, who knew what they were doing and they create these uh, images that invoke something in each of us when you look upon them. This is called liberation through seeing. I think those images invoke our innate goodness. There's goodness in each of us. Every human being has goodness. We call this a Tathangana Garbha, Buddha nature. But sometimes when you look at those sacred images, our goodness comes out. Or when you come here to hear inspiring talks from these great spiritual luminaries, you feel something is actually awakening inside you. This is a, indeed a, the awakening of your own Buddha nature. A Buddha nature, Tathangatangarbha, the inherent goodness expresses itself in two these powerful longings. One is our desire to be free from the conflict or sorrow. Another is a desire to be free. The truth is that every human being possesses this uh, basic inherent goodness, and there are moments every human being can be in touch with uh, that dimension of themselves. So, but when it's fully expressed, we call this uh, bodhicitta in Buddhist language, uh, awakened heart or awakened mind, which means uh, this profound uh, divine impulse. And uh, I think when this manifests, the bodhicitta, our desire is not just to find uh, some kind of orderly security, conventional success, but we want something more than that. We want to change our consciousness for our own happiness, for our own peace, but also we want to change our consciousness for the well-being of the entire human race, including our loved ones, our friends, even so-called our enemy. And this is the bodhicitta, as you know, uh, the barrier is uh, considered the, the capital of the bumper stickers. We have more bumper stickers than anywhere else. <laughs> and you may remember that there's one bumper sticker, which is my favorite. It goes, Gat Bodhicitta. <laughs> so, and this is my question tonight, all over, Gat Bodhicitta. <laughs> so we, we need to go inside, and you, it doesn't really matter who you are whether you identify yourself as a religious or ordinary or average Joe, average John, you, you have the ability to go inside and to feel there's this amazing impulse that is not based on your ego, not based on the, your selfishness, but something that is uh, very profound. I think uh, Albert Einstein expressed uh, this uh, a uh, divine human impulse without uh, particularly using Buddhist terminology. What he said is that uh, the vocation of the human life is to widen the circle of love and compassion towards all living beings. This is actually extraordinary. This is uh, said by Albert Einstein and sounds like something Buddha said. And I think Albert Einstein is uh, somehow without uh, knowing and recognizing there's a divine 
impulse that we all want to wake up, we want to change our consciousness. But the, as a, this extraordinary teacher said, yes, we just can't say, oh, change your mind, or then you can change the world. It sounds really nice. I was in France recently, and this uh, person gave me a gift, it's a card, and she said, go online, and there's a French heavy metal band. <laughs> and if you listen to it, the, one of their lyrics is, change your mind and change the world. I thought that's so synchronistic. This is what we're going to talk about within one week. So I guess there is some kind of desire awakening everywhere for awakening, but we need a method. It's not enough to have aspiration. In Buddhism, we say that you need the aspiration, but also you need the dharma, the means of liberation. In Tibetan, the word dharma, the true spirituality is called Chu. The true meaning of Chu is actually to transform, to change our consciousness. And uh, this is why uh, there are 84,000 methods uh, which are taught by Buddha. And uh, today we have all these amazing methods in the Buddhism, Theravada, Zen, Vajrayana. All these are methods to change and transform our consciousness. And, uh, but the most, uh, I think, important to mean is uh, at least uh, to look into our mind. This is something we don't do because uh, as a, a human society, we are not contemplative culture. Yes, there are monasteries, temples, which have a contemplative culture, but as a society, we don't have a so far contemplative culture. We are not taught to look inside. So there are two reasons why such inner transformation not happening. First, we don't have contemplative courage. We're not taught to sit and look into our mind. I think second is human beings are really afraid of looking at their mind because when you look inside your mind, you feel like you're looking into a garbage can. <laughs> so when you look inside, there's nothing really to look. It's a worry, anxiety, anger, judgment, ambition. Who wants to look into a garbage can? And so that's why many people are afraid of meditating because they had this expectation that they meditate, they're going to be happy, and they're going to open their third eye, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> but then they realize that they are looking into a garbage can again and again. <laughs> so I think we have the willingness to sit, to be contemplative, and to look into our own garbage. But there's good news. The Tibetan Buddhism teaches that everything is sacred. Even garbage is sacred. So you should remember that. <laughs> so I coined this term, which goes, uh, the sacred fertilizer. <laughs> so when you look into your own mind, you see. You don't see love immediately. You don't say, oh, I'm so loving, and I'm so compassionate. You say, oh, I see the anger, jealousy, three poisons. And then you just have to remind yourself all these are just sacred fertilizers. You have to embrace them, learn to let go of them, but uh, sometimes all you need is to recognize them, and there's a power of awareness, power of self-knowledge, and then all your neuroses, your mental habits begin to undo on their own, even they sometimes transform into awakened mind, love and compassion. So anyway, actually I don't feel really talking somehow. If image of Buddha has so much power to transform, like certain in front of a living Buddha, like Kambo Rinpoche, I believe that there's so much blessing to transform our consciousness. So personally, I don't identify myself as a speaker, but I feel so blessed to be in his presence. Uh, this is my heartfelt word. And then thank you all these wonderful spiritual luminaries. This world is blessed to, to have uh, his presence. Uh, I feel uh, Buddha Shakyamuni is here uh, and uh, very happy. So this is my sincere words. <laughs> Did I overgo the time? <laughs> Are you done for now? Do you feel complete there? Okay. 
My sense is that everybody agrees, right? They're, they're all saying basically the same thing. I want to know if any of you are, want to start a little trouble. <laughs> good trouble. You know, there's good trouble. Anybody? You know, uh, the message is pretty clear. You can change. You can change your heart. You can change your mind. You can change the world. You just have to do it. There's some techniques. I've got a technique. That's pretty much, yeah, that, that's a summary, a good summary. I, wa I want to ask, ask a question which came in a conversation driving here with Trudy Goodman, who's my beloved and also a Dharma teacher, when we were thinking about, well, what would make this less predictable? We already know that these are good things to do in some way, and most of you are practitioners, which is a beautiful thing. And as Anam Tupton says, this is your birthright. You know this in yourself. You're drawn to it. So the, the conversation the move, why is it so hard? And you talked about it's hard because you look inside and there's also your loneliness or jealousy or fear or so forth. Is it possible to change the world? Or is it just samsaric and that's the way it is? Why is it hard to change the world? Why is this? We look and we see that we want it to be different. What makes that? What's the resistance to it? And I'd love to hear from the sages around me um, to understand that. Is that trouble? Yeah, I think, well, it's, it's a, a question that has to be addressed. And I, you know, so I, I think I was telling you earlier, somebody said, uh, I wish evolution was, was faster. <laughs> I, wish it would, I wish it would hurry up. And I think that's, as you know, I think that that's the key to why it's so hard. It's because we're born with instincts, you know, that go way back millions of years and how many lifetimes we don't even know. Um, we're working with difficult uh, difficulties. Anyone else have anything to come over and change? So the question on why it's, why why it's so, it difficult. so difficult to change the world and even to change ourselves, you know? I mean, I've come to love myself, but I'm really not all that different than I was. I'm just kinder about it. <laughs> Still the same old, you know. Uh, Sharon says, I'm 40 years, I'm better, right? But there, there was, there's that poem from, from Zen Master Ryokan, the most famous, beloved Zen, Zen poet, who wrote... Um, Last year, a foolish monk. This year, no change, right? So there's some... <laughs> yeah, then he... He gave me some kashi of sarzi. Shirtang asu sim ka nang la... Shirtang asu sim ka tang munitang ni tang te la. Then he asu... Then he kung cho ta... Then he... Uh, so there are probably a few reasons for why it's difficult. Uh, the first thing, though, to note is that these feelings, anger, pride, etc., are not actually the deep layers of our mind. These are on the surface. And so at the initial phase to uh, change ourselves at uh, a really high level or advanced level is not possible. Um, once we uh, are able, though, to um, make some changes to the, our attachments um, uh, in our everyday lives and the unhappiness that they lead to, then making further changes becomes uh, not that difficult. <laughs> And there are some uh, states of mind that are possible to change with even in just one week. 
Matso lipo la jetu jawete kagreta sim la jetu jawete kagrezi tindi kutwaz kondaze. So if I were to ask the question, what's more difficult to change, our bodies or our minds? Sometimes to change our body, it's uh, change our bodies. It's a bit difficult, a bit challenging. And uh, compared to this, uh, uh, occasionally looking at changing, well, changing one's mind appears to be somewhat more easy. But the most important thing is having a good understanding of the methods of changing one's mind. Because if we don't have a good understanding of these methods, then even if we are diligent and uh, for a very long time, we won't achieve effective change. If we do have a really good grasp of the method and we are able to utilize it effectively, then it's possible that some things can undergo change within even just a week. Uh, within uh, Tibetan Buddhism, this is uh, what we say. Or, or this is the saying that we have in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, that a good practitioner sees changes in their mind every single day. And for a more average practitioner, uh, they might not see change uh, every single day, but certainly from month to month. So they will notice changes in themselves from the past month to the, pre the previous month to the present month. And even for the worst caliber of practitioner, um, <laughs> if they are diligent, then it's still the case that they will see changes in themselves from year to year. And if it's the case that we're not seeing progress or change from year to year, then this uh, must be because we don't have a good understanding or grasp of the practice method. So, in actual fact, changing ourselves um, at a level that uh, is not the highest or most advanced level is not that difficult. So the first thing, uh, as, um, uh, as, as Lama Anam mentioned, was that every day we need to um, gain, a, gain an understanding of the thoughts that arise in our minds, uh, how many positive thoughts, how many negative thoughts uh, tend to generate in our minds. In the Tibetan tradition, there are many, many people who successfully change their minds. Do 
and um, uh, practitioners uh, would observe their minds every single day and pay attention to uh, the positive thoughts they were giving rise to and the negative thoughts they were giving rise to. And um, for every negative thought, so a thought of anger, of pride, of wanting to harm someone or perhaps cheat someone, they would place in a pile a black stone, so one black stone for every negative thought. Then you bear that. And then if they gave rise to a positive thought, a thought of compassion or an altruistic thought, then they would place a white stone in a pile. And at the beginning, at the end of the day, in front of them, they would have uh, the most of the stones would be black. There would be very, very few white ones indeed. And uh, in realizing this, practitioners would be extremely shocked and on this basis would. Uh, make a resolve to uh, change their own minds. And then um, at other times after having practiced uh, for a while there would be days when half of the stones were uh, white and the other half were black. And then after quite some time of practice, they would reach a point where most of the stones were white and only a very few were black. So it's uh, like this uh, with our everyday work lives, we spend eight hours every single day devoted to them. If we were to spend uh, just like this eight hours a day in reforming our minds, then it would be a very easy thing indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Did anybody have anything they want to say in particular that do you have questions? Do we have, uh, we have some time for some questions from the audience? Is there a, a microphone out there we might take to somebody? Well, I, I got some, uh, I have a couple of questions that were emailed in. What do you feel was the most significant thing you've experienced or done in this lifetime to accelerate the process of awakening? You have a better question? <laughs> it is a good question, yeah. Would you like to sure. speak to that? The most significant thing I've done in this lifetime is go to India at the age of 18. Uh, when I was, uh, I was a junior in college, it was my third year of college, and I was uh, born in New York and grew up on the East Coast, went to college in, uh, on the East Coast, and I went to India before I'd even come to California. <laughs> so that was pretty significant. Yeah, and for me, uh, I think it was uh, committing myself to practicing for my whole life. And, and I'm saying that because uh, I, I completely agree with uh, Rinpoche that once you begin to practice, uh, it is a pleasure. So even if you uh, didn't count white and black stones, 
you would be happy, happier. You'd be feeling like you were, your life was different because you were engaged in the process that you knew you could feel is good. So, uh, so, so I think practice is actually quite easy. It's deciding to practice and continuing to practice that's very difficult. That's the hard part. It's true. Once you practice and you have good instructions, it's a pleasure. It's wonderful. But it's difficult to decide to practice and to continue. So um, one has to go pretty deeply inside oneself and, and determine, so how serious are you about this? How important is this to you? And if it is important and you are serious, then I think the rest actually is, is easy and, and it's a joy. And there's no end to how good the practice can be and how much you can gain from it over a whole lifetime and many lifetimes. But I think that partly what we're here to think about is not so much our practice, because everybody raised their hands, so everybody's made that commitment sitting here. The problem is that we look at the world around us and we see what appears to be an increased amount of craziness and, and an increased amount of violence and uh, lack of care and concern for others and for the planet. Uh, so the question for me is not how, how come it's hard for me or us, it's how come all of us collectively are not going down a better path and uh, personally, I don't know, I don't think anybody really knows. Does anybody know what's actually going on in the hearts of seven billion people on the planet Earth and what they're feeling and thinking? Does anybody know? Does the New York Times actually know? <laughs> so I personally actually think that we're doing better than ever. I think we're doing pretty well. And I think the fact that we are so anguished over the state of the world is an index of how much more we care now than we ever cared before. So I'm actually uh, optimistic. And I think that we need to continue to practice and we need to continue to, as Jack said, be mindful not only inside but also outside. And I think to continue with confidence as we're going I think we're going to be okay, and I, I think there's more caring and more love now than ever. I actually think that. And uh, by the time Sharon's book becomes a super bestseller, <laughs> we're going to know that that's true. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for raising that hope. Because yeah, I, uh, I feel that. I really do. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember leaving Bodh Gaya after our first retreat, Sharon, and saying to myself, I had been involved in radical radio before I went to India, and, and saying to myself, this has to be part of any real revolution, otherwise it it's, doesn't work. There's a, can you uh, just shout out your question? How does compassion speak to rage? Go for it. <laughs> You're on. Um, I was trying to place myself on the optimism, you know, markers, and uh, I think 
compassion can speak to rage as an example, and it's not easy. But to say it's not easy does not mean it's not possible. I think it is possible, and that is, um, well, it's, it's a few things. One is I think we need to understand that is deeply understand and come back again and again to reinforce the understanding that compassion is not weakness. It doesn't mean approving, it doesn't mean giving in. Uh, you can take very strong action, very fierce action, um, draw strong boundaries from a compassionate place rather than a hateful place. So why do we come to that aspiration? It's a few things, maybe we've suffered ourselves from tremendous rage, and we know it's suffering. That when we are lost in that state, uh, first of all, it gives us tunnel vision. You know, when we are, and I don't mean just feeling angry, I mean when we are consumed by anger, we're consumed. And um, we don't see options, we don't see a plan of action, we forget so many things. Um, we forget our own capacities, for example. If you all just now, for a moment, think about a time you were very angry at yourself, really, really angry at yourself, and bring it back. I don't know how long ago it might have been that occasioned this anger, but just bring it up. This is not a time when we say, you know what? I said that incredibly stupid thing in public, but I did five great things that same morning. Those five great things, they're gone. You know, so the more we pay attention to our inner state, the more we know it. We know this is painful. I don't want to go there again. I want to find another source of strength and power. That's part of it. Part of it is recognizing that pain in someone else, and somebody uh, kind of confronted me the other day and said, well, what about, you know, we always say people's rage and, you know, hateful action and greed is coming from a place of pain and warrants compassion. But they don't look like they're suffering. They look like they're having a fine time, you know? <laughs> and they're more and more pleased with themselves as time goes on. And it's driving me crazy, you know, if they, like, showed a little sign of suffering, then I could... <laughs> You know, I could get there, but they're like flying high, you know? And I said, I know, it's so frustrating. Like, but really we know inside. You know, it's things like that. So um, it's first understanding it's, it's a powerful response and powerful uh, reactions and actions can come from compassion. And it's also knowing that um, there's suffering involved. Our own suffering, if we just spiral down, and really the suffering of someone else, even if they look like they're having the time of their lives being rageful, they're really not. It's such a, an important question for this time. Um, and people have asked me, you know, do I do a compassion or metta loving kindness practice for difficult figures in the world, dictators or leaders who um, might be problematic. Um, <laughs> and I do. Um, and the, the practice that I do is a traditional using metta, loving kindness and compassion intentions may you be free from hatred. May you be free from ignorance. You know, may you be free, may you too be free from pain. Um, because I want that for everyone, and in particular I want it for those people. Um, it's a very, very genuine wish. Um, not only because, as you say, Sharon, that underneath rage, at least in my experience, um, there is actually pain or hurt or fear. Um, but also there's a tremendous separation that in rage it's as if I am separate from the world and that separation itself has a kind of pain in it because we're not seeing that we're connected. Um, and so, may you be free from hatred, may you be free from misunderstanding. Um, uh, those are a blessing or a prayer that I can wish for anybody wherever they are.
Yes, way in the back there, it's got the microphone. You push that little... What was the most significant thing you've experienced or done in this lifetime to accelerate the process of awakening? There was another person back there. Go ahead, raise your hand if you want to if you want to ask a question. I would like to go back to Venerable Nam Tupten's uh, reason. Actually, before the uh, having that question, why that is so difficult. I guess uh, he already kind of answered or presented because we don't have a contemplative culture. I don't think that is a problem here because everyone coming here, we do agree and then understand the uh, importance of meditation and most are actually doing it. So we do not have uh, much actually problem with it. But overall for the future, uh, how do we uh, develop or cultivate the com contemplative culture because unless we don't we don't think we think about it and then what is the destination we are all heading collectively not only for individual pre freedom or happiness so we do agree up to certain point that I need to practice hard and uh, but after all overall if we don't share the common direction and or value of being and making effort through meditation. Uh, it seems like it will take a way more time and also difficult because it, we will get distracted from own garbage bin from time to time, even though we continue doing it. So personally, individually, I wish it, 
you, you great guys today, don't go departing saying goodbye. It was a great time uh, tonight and gather together, picture more for the uh, future, how to um, develop or bring that kind of a common, wholesome value to the world to generate or grow the next generation. I Thank so you. I think, I think we get the question, which is very similar to the previous question, which is how to, how to make this work, how to uh, practice, really. And I think there's lots of different answers. There's as many different answers as there are Buddhists. Uh, <laughs> all the Buddhist schools here, almost all, are represented, except for the Hahayana. You're the, you're the Hahayana. I, I can represent the Hahayana. <laughs> there, one would you one of the things that? that's been a theme tonight and that feels really important in response to that um, is to believe in the fundamental goodness, the nobility of each human being, and to believe that the heart and mind naturally can be transformed to know this is possible and carry it both in ourselves in some way, that we actually embody it, but also to see it as a possibility for the future. Um, Norman talked about intention in some way, and you know, Sharon talked about training, all of those kind of things um, are predicated on, on a very deep understanding that this is possible. And I actually believe, like you, Norman, I'm, I'm fundamentally positive that I, I believe that the world and the consciousness of the world is evolving and that even the kind of suffering that we see is in part a reaction to, to this kind of transformation where we're becoming more, actually more interconnected and it scares people. Um, and part of our practice is not to let the outer fear colonize our hearts so that we carry instead this vision of goodness and inner freedom um, and then when we carry it, envision it in each of the lives that you have to plant those seeds to say this is possible. Um, so that to me is, is a transformation that, that spreads from us. Yeah, I, I, I think this is already happening. I think what you're wishing for is already happening. I remember when we uh, created the, the Search Inside Yourself meditation course at Google, uh, our collaborator, uh, Meng, said, my goal is to uh, make meditation halls just like gyms. There's, they're all over the place, and you either go to one or you feel guilty that you're not going. <laughs> and uh, that wasn't so long ago, and it's almost like that now. Meditation which is, after all, contemplative practice, right? Meditation is all over the place now. You can't get away from it. You can't get away from it. It's everywhere. Everybody, if you go to the therapist, they'll say, have you tried meditation? <laughs> and they'll probably be a meditator themselves, and they'll teach you how to meditate. And you'll have your own private meditation coach. Meditation is everywhere, everywhere. And that's a really good thing. I mean, of course, a lot of it is not coming from the deepest of all spiritual places, but that's okay. Little by little by little by little, we're getting there. It is actually happening. And you're right. I mean, we can't just rely on that and say it'll take care of itself. I think every one of us, for example, everybody here should take it upon themselves to support their local Dharma Center, right? You should, we should be supporting Dharma centers. It actually, excuse me for saying this, but it actually kills me to think that if you wanted to do a study of whether or not meditation helps, you could easily get $10 million to do that study. If you wanted to open a meditation hall, it would be hard to get $100,000 to have a little place to sit. So we have to change that. We have to support the Dharma centers and we have to support uh, meditation practice everywhere. But it is already happening. 
we need to do more, but it's already happening. It's all over. So I, I guess I don't agree with the premise of your question. I think it's, this is becoming a contemplative culture, little by little by little. Why? Because we're all going crazy without it. If we don't have it, we're going to go crazy. And I think everybody knows that now. Everybody knows that. Can I ask Ken Polk a, a, a question? I know we're, our time is short, but when you taught about the first levels of mind and these are things that we can do uh, to shift the negative thoughts and positive thoughts and so forth, you said, but this is not the deepest level. Now we only have a few minutes. <laughs> but something in me wants to ask if you can say a few words. It's sort of like, like dessert is there, right? <laughs> There's some. Can you say a few words about a deeper level? So in terms of this um, higher level of changing one's mind, we uh, need to understand that our eyes, our ears, our hands, these uh, senses create the world. So, for example, anything that's coloured, such as this uh, vase of flowers here, in actual fact, the flowers themselves don't possess a colour. The various red, orange, white, etc., is created by our eyes. And our eyes are cheaters quite a lot. So it's rather like the film studios in Hollywood. Mm. And everyone is sitting in uh, the Yolanchazina. Everyone is sitting in a tourist bus. Uh, but we're not moving, we're sitting still. Mm. Uh, but we are watching a 360-degree movie where everything seems to be moving. And uh, as we move through uh, mountains and uh, rivers and other sceneries, we are moving back and forth. And it's possible through this kind of simulated experience for us to have the feeling of going up mountains and falling down buildings. Uh, our mind produces this feeling. Or, so the movie is cheating our eyes and our eyes are cheating our minds. Uh, but when the movie is finished and we're, so we're not in, I've translated incorrectly, we're not in a tourist bus, we are in a, uh, a seat in a particular kind of ride or simulated experience theatre. And when the uh, movie ceases to be, then we are still back sitting in our seats. 
Then you jah nyambo dao ta, jah tini nyambo mayim ban dao, jah chimbo, jah chung chung, ma chung nawa ng nang la chak daya ka jah tisu sang ba, chik jang yo amari, rete ngat su ko jah, ngat su ko nawa ka, tini ngat su la ngor kor tang ni, jah ndu, tini jah nyambo ndu, jah ma nyim ba rizi, tini mambo zeng ndu zeng ngat su sem la. So even though uh, in actual fact there are not uh, the various pleasant sounds and unpleasant sounds, loud sounds and, and quiet sounds don't exist, our eyes, uh, uh, sorry, our ears cheat our minds such that we think that these sounds do exist. In actual fact, um, the uh, reality that our uh, eyes and our ears claim to perceive and hear, we uh, don't exist at all. So, so in actual fact, all of these things that our eyes think they see and our ears think they hear uh, don't exist at all. But in order to realize this, it's necessary for us to do advanced level meditation. And uh, through the power of advanced meditation, it is possible to uh, develop uh, that which our eyes and ears and senses perceive. Data. Oh. And uh, uh, in, at this point, we will discover that in actual fact, the world that we perceive around us is uh, just as if we were wearing uh, like virtual reality glasses. And uh, when we uh, wear these uh, virtual reality glasses, then they give us a feeling of having actually arrived in this world. However, we haven't actually arrived in this world, it's only that our eyes see it in this way. And uh, when we reach a day uh, or when we reach a point where our consciousness has uh, uh, cultivated a great uh, wisdom, then that which we see and uh, refuses to accept that which we uh, see with our eyes and hear with our ears, then the world that we perceive will be a different one. <laughs> So as to the uh, external world and the world around us, it is not determined, uh, how we see it is, uh, or how it is, is not determined by the environment itself, but uh, by our eyes. And uh, once we have worked on changing or refining our eyes, then the world will change accordingly. And uh, with regards to uh, doing this, there are many different methods in the Buddhist teachings, uh, especially within the Vajrayana tradition. And, and that's how it is, thank you.
for being here. Uh, I understand Abaya has a ceremony, a little ceremony. It's down here on this sheet. Um, sharing of merit or Okay, um, any final thoughts? Any summary, one line summaries? Sum it all up for us. So uh, our uh, teachers here tonight have uh, spoken about many great ways for changing the mind. So to sum it all up, the most important thing is that we need to look to our minds, look at our minds. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer and Evely, are you, uh, could you do a song now for us? That would be wonderful. I'd like to uh, finish with this invitation to open our hearts to falling in love with our world over and over again. So please join us in this mantra. Jasmine breeze like incense in my head Moon high in a coal black sky Illuminates my bed The train outside my windows Keeping vespers in the night Singing praises Praises for the world Life can make you bitter This life can turn you cold It seems I've spent most of my own Just trying to crack the cold But if I die tomorrow May the last words that I know be praises, praises for the world.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and spending this evening with us. Uh, do your practice when you get home. Uh, that's all we have to say, I think. <laughs>